fellow Nigerians. Events of the past few years have indicated that despite our great human and material resources, the government has not been able to fulfill the legitimate expectations of our people. Mohamed, one of the military rulers who led Nigeria through years of dictatorship, has his name engraved on some of Nigeria's most important infrastructure, including the international airport in Lagos. He was in his early 20s when he joined the Nigerian army and exited as a slain military head of state at the age of 37. One of his significant moments as a military officer was after the January 1966 coup that ousted and led to the death of the then Prime Minister Tafawa Belewa. Motola was posted to the army headquarters in Lagos as a lieutenant colonel and appointed inspector of signals. The coup was seen as targeting the north, while Agui Ronsi, an Igbo military officer, who emerged as the head of state was accused of favoring the Igbo ethnic group of the southeast and parts of the south south. A counter coup was eventually carried out, this time targeting thousands of Igbo officers. Motola was seen as a significant force in this coup, which paved the way for the emergence of Yakubu Gowon's regime, the one that led Nigeria into and out of the 1967 to 1970 civil war. In 1975, while attending the Organization of African Unity OAU summit in Uganda, Gowon was deposed and replaced by Motola. Although he did not directly take part in the coup, Motola was believed to have inspired and supported it. Motola oversaw bloodshed one of one and fell to one. The thought of further bloodshed, for whatever reason must, be revolting to our people, the armed forces, having examined the situation, came to the conclusion that certain changes were inevitable. In his inaugural speech as Nigeria's head of state on 30th July 1975, a few years after he led Nigerian troops into killing thousands of Igbos, also during the Asaba massacre, Motola announced a number of measures, each accompanied by the phrase, with immediate effect, a warned that Nigeria risked more chaos and bloodshed if things did not improve and if the government still failed to fulfill the legitimate expectations of our people. In the endeavor to build a strong, united and viral nation, Nigerians have shed much blood. The thought of further bloodshed, for whatever reasons, must be revolting to our people. The armed forces, having examined the situation, came to the conclusion that certain changes were inevitable. He said, little did he know that his blood would be shed in an abortive coup just several months into his regime. As Motala's government was gradually kicking off, Lagos, the capital of Nigeria, remained on the edge. It was the season of coups and it didn't take long before another one occurred. 13th February 1976, many Nigerians still remember this date because of the hundreds who witnessed its dark moments. On that day, like most, Motola had left for the Dodan Barracks, the seat of government in Lagos that was still being renovated following Gowon's ouster. Unknown to Motola, he was never going to make it to the barrack alive. He had left for work in his black Mercedes Benz and with Akintude Akinterinwa, his aide de camp, who sat at the back, Staff Sergeant Michael Otuwe, his orderly, and Sergeant Adamu Michika, his driver. There was no escort vehicle. He used to drive 
alone with just two people, giving himself away to any would-be assassin. Emmanuel Waye, a prominent Eda statesman in northern Nigeria, tells the story. A low profile was supposed to shield the former number one citizen from public eyes and possible attacks, but instead it made him more vulnerable. Talabon Junction in Lagos, about five minutes after the trial had left Motola's residence in Ikoi, a traffic warden stopped the cars in their direction. He had not seen the two flags in front of the former head of state's car because there have been five other cars ahead. As they waited for the green light, a red one came instead. Bullets rained on them with the bends as their only shield. A coup led by Lieutenant Colonel Buka Suka Dimka was underway. As the elderly would recall in an interview with Abuja Bay's Daily Trust News, said, I saw some people in Abada Bambariga, and when they lifted them up, they brought out AK 47 rifles and fired at us. A marksman shot the driver, Sergeant Adamu Michika, in the head, and he fell on the armrest where the suitcase containing the General's Mufti was. I took cover and fell on the driver. The General and the ADC also took cover. The gunshot stopped, but that had only been the first round. The soldiers and military officers who had ambushed him started to leave, thinking that they had killed Mortola. They were heading to the National Broadcasting Corporation to announce a successful takeover before the unexpected happened. Mortola's hid the camp, not knowing that one of the soldiers still had their eyes on the car, opened the car door to help the former head of state. The soldiers noticed the movement and ran back to the scene, as Michika puts it. During the second round, they emptied their bullets in us. Michika survived the incident as he was shot in the arm and the hip. He says it was at the mortuary that he recovered from coma when the breeze from the air condition and the pain woke him up. Dimka was eventually arrested and executed, but why was he after Motola? Why he says Dimka and the others felt he was not doing well and had a bad government. He, Dimka, preferred Gowon to remain the head of state and not General Motola Mohammed. Dimka even went to the British High Commission and demanded that they bring Gowon back from the UK where he had gone to where he had gone on exile and have him stay in one of West African countries since it was Motola who overthrew him but the High Commissioner drove him out, he tells the report. Motola's death was reminiscent of the wounds the North had suffered during Nigeria's first coup 10 years earlier. In January 1966, tagged an Ibu coup and led by Major Kaduna Nzogu. It resulted in high-profile deaths in northern Nigeria, creating a huge leadership vacuum. Among those killed were Tafawa Balewa, Prime Minister of the Northern Nigerian region, Amadou Bello, and some of the region's highest-ranking army officers. In the two more years that followed, some Islamic leaders were said to have accused Christians of plotting Motala's removal from office because he was a Muslim. The narrative, why says, was being pushed by Abubakar Mahmoud Gomi, a prominent Islamic scholar who had capitalized on the phrase, I bring you good tidings, which Dimka used to announce Motola's death. He claimed that the former leader had been killed in a plot targeting Muslims in the country. Motola's death also showed that violence has no place in government says Dr. Hakim Baba Hamed of the Northern Bay's Northern Elders Forum, who adds that while Motola brought a glimmer of hope, he came by force and arms and left that way. Baba Hamed, a hodler of a doctorate degree from the University of Sussex in the 1980s, also contends that there was a bigger problem after the military insisted on remaining in power following Motola's death. According to Baba Ahmed, the people who killed Motola killed a dream. The people who took over from Motola killed the hope that the military make such a stay 
brief and final. We missed a chance to reap from the event itself, the purpose for which he was killed. We didn't learn any lesson. For Waiye, the former head of state will be remembered for taking major decisions about the country in just six months, winning some battles and losing some. Cheta Nwanze, lead partner at Nigerian Political Risk Analysis Group, SBM Intelligence, however, begs to differ. He tells the story that Motola was far from being a great leader as his administration destroyed Nigerian civil service and brought untold suffering to many with the sacking of thousands of civil servants, some of Nigerians' best minds without benefits for Mwanzi. This move was the worst. The immediate effect with which Motola's regime often announced and implemented his policies and decisions was deficient and would ultimately have caused problems for us in the medium to long term. He says he was not a thoughtful person and he never expressed remorse or a desire to retrace his footsteps when he went wrong. Thank you guys for watching. We'll be bringing you more updates on Nigerian history. Stay tuned and stay glued. Don't forget to subscribe.